right, but I know both. And a warm welcome to everyone who has joined us here today for the webinar on Seva's approach to building sustainable women's collective enterprises and reflections on Seva's enterprise support system. This webinar is co-hosted by Seva Bharat and Imago Global Grassroots and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I'm Gayatri Rao, Program Lead for Imago in India. Today's session will be led and moderated by Yamini Atmavilas. Yamini works on the gender uh, gender equality of um, team of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that is supporting this project. In this role, she leads the foundation's women's economic empowerment strategy and gender data work. Over to you, Yamini, to lead us into the session. Thank you so much, Gayatri, and welcome to everyone who's present today and has given us um, precious time uh, of their mornings, their afternoons, their evenings, depending on where you are in terms in the world. Um, it's so wonderful to be here, and uh, I'm sad that we are not in person because the power of solidarity that you experience, especially with Seva, really is infectious and comes alive when you're just sitting in that room. Uh, but we hope that, um, you know, this webinar will also give you um, that same sense of solidarity as those of us who are interested in women's economic empowerment, women's well-being, uh, really empowering grassroots women to take um, uh, control of their own lives and um, access the kinds of um, institutions like markets and states, um, you know, in a way that empowers them and brings out their voice. So I hope that you will stay with us through the end. This is a 90 minute panel. And um, um, without much ado, let me uh, set up, um, you know, just go over the agenda for you. And then I would like to introduce the speakers because each one is an institution in themselves. So our um, our agenda, uh, I don't know, uh, Gayatri, if you're going to project it on the screen, that would be great. Um, the agenda is really um, to kick off the meeting at 5.30 p.m., uh, well, 5.35 p.m., uh, <laughs> with um, uh, essentially an uh, initial presentation by uh, Renana Jabwala and Mirai Chatterjee, Renana Ben, Mirai Ben, uh, from SEVA, who will be presenting, um, you know, work that they have begun doing, um, I suppose, as part of this project, but it's really building on decades of Seva's own work and, um, you know, taking forward this um, agenda of really trying to see how do we strengthen and scale women's collective enterprises and their own unique model of uh, collective enterprises. I'm dying to say more, but I will reserve all time possible for you to hear from them. Um, uh, following them, we will hear from uh, Salman, who's also from the Imago team. Uh, Imago is the evaluation and learning partner on this project, and they have been working very closely with Seva to really understand um, how do you set up um, and understand the kinds of change that 
um, initiatives like this can layer into uh, onto Seva's own work and at both the enterprise level as, the, as well as the individual level uh, and not to forget at the collective level. Um, and Imago partnered with um, ID Insight and from ID Insight we have Divya Nair who will be presenting some of the baseline sort of um, results of, um, of the work that, um, that is getting that has already gotten kicked off. Um, so that will be our initial sort of um, 20, 30 minutes where you will hear from them. And I encourage people who, as you're hearing, listening to them, you have questions, you have reflections, anything that, that's prompted, you think of another example in your own work, please use the chat uh, as extensively as you'd like so that we don't lose uh, the value of your feedback, of your thinking with us, um, even though the discussion time will necessarily be a bit constrained. So following that, um, we will um, um, move to our respondents and uh, we have a really eminent lineup of respondents who will each speak for about 10 minutes. And I invite the respondents to, I mean, you know, in addition, like bring your own sort of broader set of experiences and wisdom to this while, you know, obviously responding to some things that you're hearing from Seva because the whole purpose of this webinar is really to, you know, get feedback, to showcase the work that's been kicked off, to understand how does it fit with the larger ecosystem and really bring thought partnership with uh, you all who are, you know, who've worked on this, these kinds of areas for a very, very long time. So we have three um, respondents, Mr. Vijayanand, um, Ms. Simel Ezim and Mr. Samik Sundar Das. I'll introduce all the speakers in a moment, but um, these would be our respondents and they each have about 10 minutes uh, to provide their responses. And then we open it up for audience questions. So anything that's in already captured in the chat, for example, uh, we'll have a team that's sifting through them and lifting up ones that uh, can be clubbed together and brought forward for uh, response from our speakers. And my, my fond hope is that we'll have a few minutes at the end of, of this entire discussion to go back and get a little bit of another round of final comments from all of our panelists, both the presenters and the respondents. But you know that was that is my hope, and I hope that I can, <laughs> I can uh, moderate well enough to actually make that happen. Um, let me just give you a little bit of introduction. I have very long bios of people who have worked in these areas for decades. So um, please bear with me for a few minutes because I think it's you must introduce people well. Um, uh, so our first um, um, uh, speaker is Renana Jabwala, um, who's an Indian social worker, has been active for decades in organizing women in the informal economy. Uh, into trade unions, cooperatives, financial institutions, has been extensively involved in policy issues relating to poor women and the informal economy, best known for her long association with the Self-Employed uh, Women's Association, SEVA, and for her writings on uh, women and the economy. Uh, she was awarded uh, a Padma Shri from the Government of India in 1990, in the field of social work. Um, she was Chancellor Gandhi Gram Rural University and member of the UN Secretary General's high level panel on women's economic empowerment. Um, Mirai Chatterjee, our next speaker, uh, uh, who will speak together and share the presentation from SEVA, is director of the social security team at the uh, Self-Employed Women's Association. She's responsible for SEVA's healthcare, childcare, and insurance programs, was the founder and the first chairperson of the National Insurance um, uh, Vimo Seva Cooperative Limited, also of the Lok Swastya Seva Cooperative Federation. Um, she's chairperson of the Gujarat Seva, a state women Seva Cooperative Federation, which brings together 106 cooperatives with more than 300,000 members. Um, she joined Seva in 1984, uh, was its general secretary after its founder, um, Ms. Ella Bhatt. Uh, Ms. Chatterjee serves on the board of several organizations, uh, including uh, Public Health Foundation of India, Save the Children, Pradhan, uh, was advisor to the National Commission for Enterprises in the Unorganized Sector and on the advisory group of the Community Action for National Rural Health Mission. Um, Mirai Ben, with your permission, I will 
skip the rest uh, because it's another half page you are and move to um, our next speaker mr salman zahir salman uh, welcome it's a, i um, is a development professional with over three and a half decades of work experience And the last 25 years at the World Bank. Before that, that the private. Um, sorry, I think um, I can continue from there. Uh, yeah, sorry, I mean, go ahead. Uh. Yamini, yeah, we can't hear you. Sorry to intervene. Okay, three, you better yeah. come in. Yes. Um, yes, I think maybe we can. Uh, 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 special. Um, Yamani? Gayatri, come in. Yes. Um, we can uh, probably move to uh, Siva's presentation now and then uh, have the. Uh, introductions uh, after when we start the panel discussion. So uh, Mirai Ben, Janana Ben, over to you. Thank you very much. And I hope we can screen share immediately. I'm very happy to be here with all of you and our sincere thanks on behalf of the SEVA family and SEVA movement. Next, please. SEVA is a national union of 1.8 million informal women workers. We are a national union, but we are also a movement and family of organizations, including collective social enterprises. We organize women and their families at the household level for full employment and self-reliance. And full employment is a composite concept, including work and income security, social security, food security, and self-reliance in all its aspects. Next, please. Through organizing women and through praxis, very organically, our joint strategy of organizing informal workers developed over the years. As I said, we are a national union and through workers' struggles for better working conditions and minimum wages, we came upon certain lessons which included the importance and the need for collective enterprises, uh, originally cooperatives, uh, because we found that it was a good way of intervening in the labor market and also offering alternative livelihood and employment and offering the workers hope in their long struggle and the long road ahead. Also our philosophy, which is based on the values and ideas of Mahatma Gandhi, always also focuses on constructive alternatives. Next, please. 
collective social enterprises, of course, when women come together, there's some energy and creativity and pooling of talents and skills, and they create their own collective social enterprises. And this, of course, increases their collective strength, bargaining power, helps them to stand firm in the marketplace, and they own these enterprises. Also, we notice over time, there is a change in the body language of women. When they began to de begin to deal with money, when they begin to deal with the outside world as well, then we see that they are confident, their leadership blooms, and there is overall social impact, not only in their own families, but also in their villages, in their communities, and in society at large. Next, please. Like to focus a little bit on our approach. Next slide. Yeah. So for us, having grown out of the labor movement in India, organizing, which is the bringing together of women, uniting them across caste, class, religious, linguistic, geographic differences and regions is our basic building block. I think another hallmark of our approach is the holistic and integrated approach where women we have found need a whole slew of services like financial services, healthcare, childcare, insurance, capacity building, and so on, if they are to build up their collective enterprises and entrepreneurship. Also, it's very important for women to be recognized as economic contributors. So voice, representation, visibility, very much part of our approach. And then naturally building sustainable businesses, sustainable enterprises in all its aspects. And importantly for us, women are in the center. Not only are the users and owners, but they're very much involved in the management of their own collective enterprises. Next, please. Over, oh, um, yes. The Seva Cooperative Federation, I wanted to speak about this because our first set of cooperative I mean, uh, collective enterprises, excuse me, uh, cooperatives, because we began in Gujarat and Gujarat has a strong cooperative movement. And our very first cooperative was Seva Bank. Um, Seva Bank, this is another reason for setting up our own enterprises. When we went to mainstream banks, they wouldn't have us. And so we set up our own services through a cooperative. And then there was a whole lot of cooperatives that were actively built up in the 80s and 90s. And when we had a critical mass of 33 of these cooperatives, um, the women began to say, the cooperative leaders began to say, we need these kind of services, capacity building, business development, policy action, and so on. And that's why in 1992, we registered the Seva Cooperative Federation in Gujarat. It's a state level federation. It's itself a cooperative and it provides services to our member cooperatives in six sectors. Next, please. Yeah, over the years, almost five decades now of organizing in the Seva movement, we have promoted 147 social enterprises, as you can see, and about 70 of them are active. Most of them are cooperatives, and the average size is 100 to 500 members, although some of them, like Seva Bank, have thousands and thousands of members. When we began our partnership with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we had a whole lot of enterprises to work with, but six enterprises were chosen for intensive support. Uh, and this was based on a rigorous selection process of all these enterprises. Next, please. Yeah. A few words, a snapshot really about the Seva Cooperative Federation. We promoted 110 cooperatives, out of which 65 are active today. And out of those 65, 88% are viable enterprises, financially viable enterprises run by women, of course, with the support of professionals, as you will hear shortly. Next, please. Seva Bharat is our national federation of sevas, which was started in the early 80s. And building on the experiences of organizing in Gujarat and collective enterprises, mainly cooperatives of Gujarat, Seva Bharat quickly extended its support and work to eight states, as you can see. And 22 enterprises have been supported, including 
five digital pilots. And of course, it isn't a sort of just lifting the model. Uh, it is their own innovations and adapting uh, because in every state we do not have cooperatives and the cooperative laws also fall short. Next, please, Renana Ben, over to you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Mirai Ben. Uh, so uh, let me come to the particular work we are doing now. And um, <clears throat> um, we have this partnership with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, and also with Imago. And we have called this partnership a Mahila Owned Viable Enterprises, or in Hindi, Mahila Udyam Vikas, which reads as move, which is what we want to do. Next, please. Um, the vision of move really is to focus into how we build, how we use the SEVA method to build um, social enterprises and develop evidence-backed replicable methods of empowering women uh, by building women's collective social enterprises through SEVA's approach of rights and development. Uh, what we won't be talking about is uh, the learnings or rather the, the, we will be talking about the learnings, but I mean the um, part of SEVA, which is developing evidence base. And Imago is the main, uh, our main support in developing this evidence base. So it's going deep into what we are doing in action. And the methods that we will develop, what works, what doesn't work, will be used for further organizing by SEVA. And also we will share it with others um, to promote women's economic empowerment. Next, please. Conceptual, next, please. Uh, so first, as Miraiben showed, we studied what we have already done over the last 30 years. And what we found is that the SEVA approach, as she explained, involves organizing and uh, building up these collective businesses. And uh, we find that because we have so many different things that people are doing, we don't really focus well on the development of the collective enterprise. And so now what we realized was there was a need for an enterprise support system which promoted and supported these collectives to become sustainable businesses while also becoming methods of empowerment. And this is very difficult to be both a business uh, profitable as well as to focus on the social objective of empowerment. Next, please. Next. Um, I'm not going, no, no. Yeah, I'm not going to go through this in great detail. Uh, this is the um, in, uh, enterprise support system structures. We're still experimenting, but these are the kinds of things that the uh, ESS does, uh, both in the cooperative federation so capacity building, finance, marketing, communications, research. Next, please. And mentors. And also in the in Seva Bharat. And in Seva Bharat, we also have an additional board, which looks at, which consists of um, people from Seva and external experts, which look at all the methods of the uh, ESS. Next, please. So I'm not going into detail. You can look at that. What I really want to focus on is we talked about evidence base. Um, we hope we'll be able to provide the evidence, but I'd like to talk about our key learning so far. And please, next. Um, firstly, we our collective enterprises form a hybrid system. In what way? Because it's a hybrid of grassroots women who are the users, the, the uh, owners, as well as often the managers and professionals who bring in work expertise and a productive pace and depth of work. And the thing is that it's not easy to build these hybrid uh, systems because grassroots women are not used to dealing with professionals uh, and professionals, um, you know, have bring in a top down managerial style. 
So we have to train the professionals and train the grassroots women to work together as equals. Um, we also, you know, nurture women managers not just women from the grassroots, but it's often we've found very difficult to get women managers at the grassroots and encourage women in leadership roles. Next, please. And now I go through the learnings. One of the first things that women in these collective enterprises, as well as their management says, oh, we need finance. And uh, we analyzed what kind of finance, so launching the enterprise, a mix of grant and contribution from the women in the form of shares or in the form of uh, contrib actual contributions. Going forward, we have mixed financing that is grant, loan, etc. And then later on loans and or investments. However, once you come to point two and point three, we find that most mainstream financial institutions are not ready to finance collective enterprises. There are many reasons for that, which I won't go into now. Um, and we don't fit into their criteria. Therefore, we need a dedicated finance pipeline with criteria which matches what these collective enterprises are like. Um, and that is something that we are lobbying for. And interestingly, since Mr. Vijayan is here, we are also talking to NRLM who's feeling exactly the same thing. So we are wondering if jointly we can try and get a pipeline like this. Next, please. Capacity building is a felt need. People feel they don't know enough. They don't know how to run enterprises. So we really need to build up the capacity of the grassroots women um, as leaders, digital skills, management skills. Next, please. Next, please. And everybody says help us in marketing identify marketing avenues give us orders um, so these are the three needs that are felt by the enterprise and that the enterprise support system tries to help with next please however uh, oh yes and this is another one mentoring and we have found mentoring to be one of the most powerful tools when you have sector specific mentors who are available for the teams but who, men, who invest in uh, building and nurturing the entire team. Um, and the mentors, of course, create linkages outside. And so mentoring is something that the enterprises really appreciate. Next, please. However, there are certain things that we have found as organization, as the ESS, which we more or less have to tell the enterprise, well, you must do this and it's necessary they don't feel it. For example, building MIS systems. Those are very important to run a business, but uh, people don't like MIS systems. They like ad hocism. And so building an MIS system is a very important point and putting systems into place, especially for compliance, um, uh, because we live in a society where, the, where there are many regulatory agencies. So this is something the ESS has to teach. Renana Ben, could I ask you to um, you have a couple of minutes left on the time allotted. So um, just walk us through the rest. Yeah. Next, please. Um, and this is another thing that's necessary, but not felt. Um, mostly women in these enterprises are very inward looking. We have to help them to look outwards to the new things to the opportunities in the ecosystem. Next, please. Um, and finally, organizing needs to be continuous. More women need to come in. We need to keep working on empowerment, bring women around common issues and link them to all other uh, social security schemes so that they remain invested in this effort. Next, please. And finally, this is not easy. There's a five to 10 year horizon until the collective becomes completely on its own. Um, it requires patience, persistence, and perseverance. We can't say, oh, well, you know, in one year now you must produce the enterprise. 
or in five years, you must suddenly scale up to five states. So this is a slow uh, process, which one must pers persevere in. So thank you. I think I've come to the end of what I wanted to say. Uh, thank you so much, Mirai Ben and Renana Ben. Let me now hand it over to the evaluation team. I now invite uh, Salman Zahir. I'm sorry you couldn't hear my intro before, but I'll keep it short. He's senior advisor, Imago, uh, and is a development professional with over 30, uh, 35 years of experience. Um, and then I invite him. So with him, uh, Divya Nair, who's uh, director at ID Insight in New Delhi and leads a lot of the social sector evaluation. So over to you both. Great. Uh, it's a privilege being invited to this. Thank you very much or to, to everyone. Um, yes, just I'm uh, going to just focus a little bit on uh, from drawing from my experience on building organizations which are fit for the purpose for which they are being set up in the context within which they are expected to succeed. And um, um, and let me, uh, you know, those have been in the private sector, the public sector, in, in public services like water, sanitation, electricity, energy, um, uh, as well as in, man in the private sector in manufacturing and production. So I, um, uh, and I'm a complete newbie. My path has intersected with SEVA over the years uh, in multiple levels, but I'm not, uh, I, I can't say I'm, a practitioner of the type seva uh, of the kind of work does. So take my uh, sort of observations or impressions as a newbie. Uh, I'm sure I'll go native soon enough and then I'll be uh, perhaps less provocative. Uh, but let me just start with saying that um, I, I, I'm, it's the fit for purpose part of the social enterprise development support, which I'm really going to focus on. And my sense is that um, between the is set up for contradiction. I mean, you, uh, Renana Ben said it, others said it, between the social and the enterprise, there's almost a, a structural um, contradiction. The entrepreneur, uh, the enterprise has uh, messages of entrepreneurship, decision making, uh, and, uh, and 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 very energetic. Whereas the social and particularly collective social so there's a there's a sort of a dichotomy there which needs to be navigated. It's not surprising that one of your one of the evaluations mentioned that. Individual social enterprises talk about needing uh, training in entrepreneurial skill development, decision making, risk taking, whereas the ones from the collective social enterprises talked about uh, needing support with better standardization. Uh, so I think uh, they asked, these are the kind of uh, things we. So if if you you mentioned this is a move. Um, and a move, is it expected to accelerate and if possible, lift off? My sense is that the model is not designed for lift off. The engines are not powerful enough to lift the kind of load you want to carry, which is more and more women who will uh, derive a living from, from the kind of, whether it's profits or satisfaction or just market share, which these enterprises are going to develop, are going to be targeted to do. So I don't, I'm, I'm really not sure whether injecting better technical skills in planning and finance and a whole lot of other things actually will reconcile this dichotomy between the lift and the drag. And I've space. If you want, uh, as, you, as Renana Ben said, this is designed for five or 10 years, and it has to be. But even over five or 10 years, are there going, is there going to be enough of lift of the people you want to lift with the kind of growth engines you are providing this model? Or will there have to be some relaxation almost of the principles? 
it's very difficult because this is almost like there's a clash of, uh, there, there's an identity conflict, which is trying to be tackled with technical tools of better management and better. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, my, I don't want to be pessimistic, but my sense is that you either need some flexibility on the principles, either in time and space, that means relax some of these things. So you have some examples of liftoff, which is providing both satisfaction, income, and a growth model to the, to the members you're trying to bring into this, uh, into this uh, thing. And if you can give some good examples, which are really starting to fly, uh, my sense is that you can bring many more people into the wake. Uh, I'd like to just stop with saying, I'd, I'm not sure you actually want lift off. There's a sense that, and I've worked with some of the, well, at least one of the enterprises, there's more, uh, and this may be a COVID moment, but there's more interest in providing more work to more people than creating the surpluses and the reputation in the market, which says that these enterprises are, uh, are, are, are wanting to be sustainable. It may be early days, but I like, the closing point I would say is that if, if we really are serious about profits and sustainability through profits and a reputation in the market of quality of timeliness and all, I think perhaps uh, we need to sort of grapple with the mindset side of this. How are we reconciling between these principles, which are great, but how flexibly are we applying them in the context of lift off and getting people out of poverty? Let me just stop with that. I really don't mean to be pessimistic. As I said, I'm a newbie on this, uh, but I think these are more identical rather than technical tools. The technical tools are absolutely necessary, but if they're going to be provided in a way identity crisis has not been adequately resolved, then I think they might be very frustrating for either the managers or the uh, members or Seva itself. Let me just stop there. Uh, thank you, Salman. Lots of provocative thoughts. I'm sure uh, we'll have a very rich discussion a little later, but over to you, Divya. Great. Hi. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, really, it's been a privilege working with uh, Seva Bharat and with um, Imago on this, you know, as uh, the previous speaker said, this very like challenging, but very inspiring, you know, idea of basically getting, uh, you know, these two goals that are sometimes conflicting to potentially, um, you know, actually both actualize. And uh, ID Insight is supporting Imago basically to, um, I just need one of this. Um, ID Insight is supporting Imago in evaluating the ESS, which is the Enterprise Social Support System. Um, our goals basically over the next few years are to uh, support Imago uh, and of course Seva Bharat in understanding whether they uh, are able to kind of uh, improve these, uh, you know, economic outcomes for members, but via the improvement of performance of these social enterprises. And so uh, we have two uh, evaluations kind of working in parallel. At the social enterprise level, we're looking at uh, outcomes of the enterprises and looking at, you know, their profitability and the, the path that they take as they improve with the ES ESS. And then at the member level, we're looking at, uh, you know, change over time for the member outcomes. So there are these two kind of levels of evaluation. And uh, I will actually be focusing more on the enterprise level, uh, on the social enterprise level during this presentation. So we've just conducted a baseline and I'm going to be sharing some of the results from that. Uh, we were in the field uh, in December and uh, basically this was just as you know, the, the COVID uh, first wave was kind of coming down. And what we were able to do is establish uh, a sense of what the baseline, the cu current outcomes at the firm and member level look like. We were able to collect some data on the context of these social enterprises. Uh, and we also, uh, you know, I'll talk more about the methodology, but 
you know, we've also kind of uh, divided up the way that we've looked at uh, uh, the goals, which is the business goals and the social goals. And the business goals are focused on, uh, you know, profitability and independent financial independence, etc. Whereas the social goals are looking at uh, whether you know livelihoods of these members are actually improving. We also have uh, looked a little bit at uh, women's agency measures. So. Um, just as a reminder, there are these six social enterprises that the ESS is going to be working with. Uh, in fact, they will continue to work with five of them over time. Uh, as you can see, they are spread out, but three of them are focused on financial services. So they're Sartha, Bihar Credit Cooperative, Delhi Credit Cooperative are focused on financial services. And then the top two, Ruab and Lok Swasthya, are product-based. Uh, so, for example, Lok Swasthya is the oldest uh, social enterprise here, and they sell, uh, you know, medicines for uh, uh, Ayurvedic uh, and allopathic medicines, and it's a product-based uh, service. The last one, Karnabhumi, is a uh, pharma uh, FPO. So there are different models here, and just kind of going back, that uh, each of these is separate, uh, distinct in terms of the models that they have. And uh, you know, from an evaluation perspective, it is challenging for us to kind of uh, you know tease apart some of this. Uh, so we, that was one of the reasons also why we have these you know two levels of looking at the enterprise level and the uh, member level. So to get deeper into the, I'll first present on the enterprise level, we did these in-depth interviews with managers or CEOs of the six social enterprises. So these were qualitative interviews. Uh, they were also supplemented with work that Imago is already doing. So we collected data uh, and kind of joined forces to understand what uh, you know, the social enterprises are looking like. Um, um, and this was, you know, uh, a lot of it was uh, reported by as impressions by um, uh, CEOs and, mem uh, and managers. And then we also complemented it with some financial data. I won't be presenting the financial data because that is confidential, but, you know, we do use it to kind of triangulate some of what we are finding. Um, so quickly, in terms of enterprise findings, uh, basically, we do see that you know, social enterprises do prioritize their social goals. And, you know, this goes back to what Renanaji and Miraji were talking about, which is that, you know, the, there is this deep uh, social mission that Seva has. And, you know, that kind of does carry through uh, across, uh, you know, to the members and uh, in terms of the way that they are, they are set up. However, as, uh, you know, the discussion just you know is happening is that it is very challenging to balance the social and business enterprises so out of the six enterprises that we've looked at one is profitable uh, independently the the remaining uh, um, you know held up uh, by grants often via seva uh, managers do report that uh, you know it is kind it is challenging to uh, you know, prioritize profitability because they're also kind of balancing member needs. For example, you know, one of the um, uh, one of the ways that the credit uh, cooperatives are working is they're home based, and that kind of increases the cost, and so you know that uh, makes them a little bit less profitable. But it does give them a distinct model. Uh, and then similarly, most uh, SEs practice, what, what we do find, the positive is that uh, most of these SEs do follow a lot of simple management practices, which, you know, take them uh, a long way. So in terms of not being profitable, this is an area that, as I mentioned, the ESS is going to be working on. You know, they're going to be getting a lot deeper in terms of understanding really what are the bottlenecks and how to improve uh, profitability and financial independence. But a few of the areas that have emerged already is lack of capacity and skills, you know, lack of business plans, uh, the sector specific challenges, for example, you know, especially the financial SEs do have to comply uh, uh, as Renanaji was saying, you know, they have a whole range of uh, issues that they have to comply with in a very fiercely competitive environment. And then Similarly, uh, you know, I'm going to skip a little bit, but I thought this was an interesting framework that was, uh, you know, 
used by David McKinsey and, uh, um, and Woodruff, where they tried uh, collecting, getting a sense of how small social enterprises are performing across seven countries. So those included Bangladesh, Kenya, Mexico. So the, uh, and they basically came up with this uh, finding that actually, uh, you know, these business practices, they're these core business practices that improvement in them can actually improve uh, labor productivity. And these are some very simple ones, which are what the, the key insight was also that how it's very rare that many of these very simple, uh, you know, activities are followed. So for example, um, it, only 7% of the many enterprises that they interviewed were actually, uh, you know, ha had bookkeeping. Of, uh, whereas over here, as you can see, uh, most of these enterprises are doing pretty well on all of these. The white ones are actually not, not applicable. So if you just look at the blue, most of them are dark blue. And then there are a few light blue where there is some room for improvement. But most of them are, you know, advertising. They are they are looking at what competitors' prices are. So these, uh, you know, basic uh, kind of business activities are being undertaken. I will now jump to the member level outcomes. And the idea here, as I said, was to kind of understand whether some of the, you know, the involvement in these social enterprises is flowing into some of the uh, empowerment measures that are so key to uh, Seva's philosophy. So we looked at, uh, you know, these were the categories of empowerment that we looked at. Uh, please note that uh, I forgot to mention that this was all uh, phone-based surveys. So we only got about 30 minutes with each of these members. Um, and we kind of had to squeeze in as much as we could given, you know, the time constraints on a phone survey. Uh, and what happened here is that we uh, got, we were able to speak to 1,500 plus members and we hey, uh, you know, Divya, sorry yeah. to interrupt would you mind sharing the actual findings and then we can yes. certainly part the if anyone has questions on the methodology for the q a apologies we're already running a few minutes late because we started a bit late so absolutely, absolutely. i just have two slides yeah. thank uh, you so, uh, these are you know just the high level findings basically what we do find is that uh, you know, the members are earning around 6,000 rupees per month. And out of that, around 3,000 plus in December was from the social enterprises. So a large proportion, about 63% of their income is coming from social enterprises. And we also, uh, and you know, when we benchmark it, this, this is comparable to, uh, you know, they are basically above performing above average uh, when you look at other in statistics from India. Similarly, when you look at poverty, only 20, uh, like 25% of members were below the poverty line. Uh, and this kind of compares to the national average. So, you know, the members are basically not poor, but, you know, they are, but they're doing well in terms of income. And in terms of savings, for example, given that, uh, you know, self-help groups is a core part of the theory of change here in many cases, around, you know, a large proportion, 91% of those who are saving are saving informal, um, you know, uh, resources and particularly actually in SEVA um, uh, accounts. And then this is my final slide. And I, I think this, you know, really is heartening in the sense that uh, there is the sense that uh, members, 93% of them are believe that, you know, women should be jointly involved in decision-making. And similarly, in terms of mobility, remember again, this was during the time of COVID, around 57% of women are, you know, say that they do travel alone and, you know, without permission. In terms of scope for improvement, however, what we do see is that there is a gap between the poorest and the richest of these members. And, uh, you know, this is something to keep in mind is that there is still, you know, a catch up that is possible even within the members that SEBA is working with. So I will stop here and uh, pass over to the next speaker. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Divya. Uh, without much ado, let me now uh, thank the all the panelists for some very, very thought provoking and um, rich sort of presentations and turn over to our um, set of respondents. Our first respondent is Mr. Vijayanand, who for those from uh, this country and perhaps those who work on collectives and uh, enterprise of women is no 
stranger but a couple of quick lines of introduction he's a very very senior and seasoned bureaucrat was secretary panchayati raj with additional charge of secretary rural development in the ministry of rural development he was former chief secretary of kerala headed the was member of the second and fourth state finance commission and is currently chairing the sixth finance commission has played a very very huge role in um, ensuring devolution of funds powers personnel to local government institutions um and welcome sir and uh, we i know we asked you to speak for about 10 minutes but i'm wondering if uh, we can average around 8 and then <laughs> have another minute of for you from you at the very end but um, over to you now for responding to what you heard and also additional remarks thank you for the nice words but i must also add that i was part of kudumbashree from the day of conceptualization for about 19 years yes and, and also how could i miss that <laughs> yes i i didn't give it so now this, talking about micro enterprises i i will basically speak from my experience in nrl at the national level and kudumbashree most of them are in the lower end of industry not reaching anywhere about 2 to 3 lakh mostly around 1 and 1/2 lakhs local materials local markets mostly unbranded and mostly originating in an ex existing activity or taking forward an experience these people had and often responding to a trigger mostly from government or sometimes from agencies like seva and in kerala we found that this here everybody goes up to class 10 this class 10 failed 35 to 40 years married and the units are generally of small size around 5 and talking to these people basically they are not just impressions more the uh, participant observance comments that the trajectory of growth they when i was speaking about a 5 to 10 year here they say almost by rule in the, the last quarter of the first year you will run into a crisis and if you can get out of it then the last quarter of the second year you run into the second crisis if you can get out of it then you will survive this is what the impression of many of this enterprises so here the intuitive of the leader within comes up and also somebody from outside helping uh, is that becomes very critical and size of the collective many a times you create a collective without harmonizing it with the commercial logic of the business activity either individual or as uh, as a big sector and how does a collective become natural organic so uh, somebody gave me a very interest in comment that service sector collectives are more organic than manufacturing collectives where there is a leader a group leader and almost having an employer kind of status the biggest problem has been addressed quite well under nrl and in kudumbashri the management issues just as we talk of gdp of the poor we need to talk of management of by the poor and you can't just uh, graft big business techniques into local thing it has to be evolved from below otherwise it's because they have huge coping skills the traditional coping skills of the poor need to be factored in before getting into the conventional enterprise management field then many of them fear formalities so they miss out on all the government uh, kind of benefits except some initial subsidies particularly big benefits and formalization scares them and rightly so most of the fpos in kerala have burned their fingers just because the companies couldn't cope with the company law and even if it's liberalized so udyog aadhar people are not able to get in because they have this fears so that is another big issue and links with bureaucracy most of them are livelihood nrlm have a touch with bureaucracy though it's a light touch and it is not a happy touch it's a uh, apathy antipathy small kinds of corruption and mostly delays and bureaucratization which is quite difficult and of course we have been we all know there are no uh, insurance products so while in my journey i had come across a no name insurance organized by vivekananda for the south india fishermen group sips that is just trust based but it's very difficult to do and another thing which we have nobody has mentioned ethics of small business in the pursuit of profit they make mistakes not malapen and that cost them dear so that is something which we need to look into and another thing which is in all the analysis of nrl kudumbashri has also come out inclusion is weak the sc and particularly tribals persons with disabilities 
and poorest of the poor don't benefit to the extent possible and no smooth closure is there you are left hanging in the air with your tail so that is very very important so that is something which there's a bifr where big industries so we need some kind of informal system to help them closure and somebody told them somebody told me there is shift to appropriate business you can't do this but you can shift but who will tell them who will guide them in this support system something which some observers of kudumbashree told me the most important support system has to be found within the family often we miss out miss out the family while nurturing enterprise mostly it is a male or maybe the kind of thing then this we have the micro enterprise consultant and innovation of kudumbashree basically the community resource person the mentor just above and possibly a specialist on call for many of this the three tier kind of system looks very very uh, possible and now there is a scheme called unnat bharat abhiyan so if we get get some of the big names like iims and irma into this we can do this and somebody told me we need an mba for the poor so that is something kerala is doing some very interesting exam uh, results through uh, an organization called trees basically by crowd sourcing and forum for peer learning how they can share experience a small cii kind of uh, thing is also very very important and then criticality of the initial motivation and choice that is very important how do they choose an activity and state cso community based organization for confidence and cso for support and state for negotiating with big markets not markets basically public sector and then something which i had been lobbying we nearly came to a success when we were in delhi in 2012 13 is a nabard like bank for women focusing on we almost came for what because i can't offic- can disclose official secrets i will not get it is very ugly kind of thing which happened we lost it forever now let me conclude uh, salman me- mentioned lift off but i have seen directly observed It's for the poor, it's not a question of lift off. Are they better off than they were yesterday? And can they hope something for the future? So we need a new criterion for evaluation. And how can we choose the links in the value chain which are most suitable for a particular group? And the social justice element I mentioned. And a big lesson from Kerala is partnership with local governments. In from the empowerment angle, sixty-seven percent of the elected representatives in Kerala. of all local governments right from district panchayat corporation gram panchayat are from kudumbish so that is again a kind of thing and my experience shows there is a ladder of empowerment and somebody can push beyond not you can't push beyond a point but you can push but certainly we need a big push like the moment of operation flood in the 80s the sgs in the early 90s that's the kind of thing we need for this and let me end with a suggestion that seva and kudumbashree can get into a partnership not to do anything to learn from each other to be a huge learning experience thank you thank you so much uh, mr vijayanand and perfect timing i must say um again very very um wonderful comments that i hope we can come back to and uh, reflect on let me um, hand it off to and invite simel asim uh, from the uh, who's program manager at the enterprises department of the international labor Organ- office in that capacity she leads the ilo's work on cooperatives and the social and solidarity economy um earlier used to be a gender specialist at the regional office for arab states um where she led gender equality and transition from informal to formal economy and decent work she uh, has also okay. been an economist at uh, icrw over her career um over to you simel Thank you, Yamini. Um, so at uh, ILO's COP unit, we work with cooperatives and the wider social and solidarity economy. And this research and webinar comes at a time when there is growing momentum on the social and solidarity economy. This includes COP, social enterprises, informal economy associations, women's self-help groups, collect women's collective enterprises. And uh, what brings this umbrella together is. Uh, enterprises with social and economic and increasingly more environmental uh, 
uh, goals, values of mutualism, self-help and solidarity, and some degree of exercising uh, worker ownership or democratic governance. It's seen also as one of the commentators said in the chat, Natalie, SAC is seen as a way to contribute to building more inclusive and sustainable economies in light of the growing inequalities, uh, growing unemployment, climate crisis, uh, especially in the aftermath of the pandemic. And there will be an upcoming general discussion on social and solidarity economy at the International Labor Conference next year. Uh, we are preparing an office report for that. So the findings from this research would be very uh, important to integrate uh, there. So uh, creating an enabling environment of conducive legal and policy frameworks is one of the essential elements of uh, when we talk about uh, creating sustainability and scale for uh, social and solidarity economy enterprises, SSE. The other, of course, is what has been discussed here, strengthening the building blocks of a conducive ecosystem of financial, educational, marketing, mentorship arrangements. The experiences of SAVA's system uh, will, of course, uh, I have, all, of course, been uh, very well uh, in, uh, uh, inspired a lot of uh, uh, women's uh, uh, collectives and initiatives around the world. One thing I had not heard from Sewa and uh, our sisters and Sewa's uh, institutions, well, and I would be interested to hear more about, is mentorship. Uh, there are some mentorship board models. I'm not sure if that's what Sewa is talking about when they say mentorship. Uh, uh, but these mentorship models based on international solidarity, uh, pairing up co-op experts in a specific field with, in one country, volunteering their time and know-how to support cooperatives in the same field in another country. And this can go south-south, south-north, north-north. Uh, so that's something I would be interested in. Uh, I also put in uh, the chat, you know, franchising is something that is coming up uh, recently from experiences of domestic worker cooperatives, for instance, in the US, uh, through the Sprightly uh, experience to scale up uh, worker cooperatives as a enter business cluster model. Um, and of course, consortia, but I will come to that a little later. I wanted to say uh, something about, uh, you know, this five to 10 years that Ananaben was talking about uh, the patience needed. Uh, so when Sewa inspires uh, other uh, countries, uh, to, uh, for instance, my own country, Turkey, uh, there has been uh, women's uh, NGOs establishing women uh, cooperatives, uh, creating a women co-op union. Uh, I'm uh, talking about the experience of KEDEV, the Foundation for Support of Women's Labor. And uh, the union provides, of course, a range of services uh, in across a number of sectors, like the ones mentioned uh, here, from uh, market links to uh, local government outlooks like bazaars, online markets and shops and so on. But financing is a, a key element that's uh, very weak. And, you know, co-op development banks, co-op development funds are very important to uh, the strengthening uh, as the, of a, of a uh, ecosystem, uh, cooperative uh, social economy ecosystem. Uh, what's interesting is, and uh, the commentator uh, before me has mentioned this, the work, uh, working closely with um, a loose network of uh, organizations is critical. This includes, of course, local government, municipalities, regional development agencies, and even, you know, uh, public, private, vocational education institutions, business development institutions. Uh, and, of course, uh, organizations like, say, was uh, co-op uh, uh, federation could support that kind of uh, networking. I know some of them, of course, is going on, but doing that in a bigger and more systematic way, I think uh, maybe something to that uh, could use uh, further thinking. Uh, some, of course, some of the research that's coming from the women co-ops in Turkey says, okay, you know, uh, the co-ops are starting before their product services, business plans are well thought out. This is a concern also the, uh, that they often tend to duplicate similar product lines and market their products in similar markets, increasing the risk of overcrowding. And then what happens is, oh, women's collectives, women co-ops don't work, off with the model, you know? Um, so generating a scale is, is of course, uh, one of the big challenges. Um, 
I wanted to reflect on this consortium model of social cooperatives in Italy. Italy has a strong uh, tradition of social cooperatives that produce uh, goods and services of social utility in culture, welfare, education, but also integrating disadvantaged people into employment. And while these are not uh, women's cooperatives, the women are the majority of the founders, leaders, workers, members. Um, and this has model, like Sewa has inspired many others, this Italian co uh, social co-op model has inspired many. Um, and they are more often multi-stakeholder in nature, something to look into again uh, where, uh, in moving forward, maybe with Sewa, where the workers, beneficiaries, and local governments are part of membership, partnership, uh, you know, and laws are being passed uh, around the world to allow for such uh, multi-stakeholder uh, social cooperatives to work uh, and uh, also work, they, they often work very closely with this local governments. What's the, how does this consortium model work? A number of co-ops come together, build a consortium in order to apply for public sector procurement of services like childcare, elderly care, uh, care for people with disabilities and uh, Local government would put out a call. Individual co-ops don't have the scale to respond. But then when they get together in the consortia in this uh, new entity, they can create the scale needed. And uh, usually they can also, once they register this uh, consortium as an enterprise, they can also provide other services to their members like joint purchasing of land. It creates some flexibility. If one form of enterprise doesn't get in the system of, let's say, benefiting from uh, financing and the rest, uh, the other can uh, step in. Uh, and what's interesting is that these social cooperative co uh, have a priority treatment in selection of procurement services. And this is another policy, you know, advocacy area, I think, uh, giving priority co-ops and other uh, the social solidarity economy enterprises. Uh, there is uh, quite a bit of research around this, so it would be perhaps uh, look good to look into as policy advice uh, in the research. Moving away from women co-op, social co-op, but also still staying in Italy. There are regional district level ecosystems, similar maybe to the Kerala system that are good examples for scaling up. Like in Northern Italy, Emilia Romagna region, and this has come from total destruction after the second world war, you know, that they, it was the need as the mother of all invention. Um, so this region has one of the densest cooperative economies in the world, producing around third, uh, with two out of three people being a co-op member and uh, the co-op system produces around one third of the region's uh, gross domestic product. And how was such a scale uh, reached? There is an interwoven um, fabric of horizontal, vertical, complementary networks of organization that support each other, refer to each other, uh, provide the services to each other, including financing. And um, uh, with the local government, you know, as the backbone. Uh, and these uh, could be research institutions, co-op banks, training organizations, which provide the advantage of scale, flexibility without the risk of over-centralization. Um, and it can uh, create also interest at different levels, different sectors to grow. And it's uh, more flexible, as I mentioned, in the face of internal and external shocks, like big leadership change when one generation you know, is gone and the next is coming and there's a total shift, you know, how do you avoid that? Or external shocks like a, a pandemic or a financial uh, crisis. Uh, Mondragon Initiative is often uh, referred to Mondragon. Um, Finishing last words, last words. Right. <laughs> the Mondragon Initiative in the Basque Country in Spain is different from this pattern in Emilia Romanda. Mondragon keeps everything under one umbrella while creating new co-ops or other types of subsidiaries that are not necessarily all co-ops, but across sectors, finance, retail, industry, and it's often considered the most successful example of worker-owned. Pop and it started like, you know, Sewa, very small. It had a handful of workers doing paraffin cookers. And now it has like 82,000 workers and 258 uh, co-op-owned uh, uh, businesses, etc. Of course, there's critique when you get, when, how big is too big, you know, and, uh, you know, while you're scaling up, do you go 
over and lose the values and principles like Mondragon is now also being criticized for having uh, more employees that are not owners than worker owners. Uh, so this is like creating a two-tier system. So something to be uh, cognizant of when you're growing. Uh, you could see Seva Enterprise Support System is a network of linked institutions providing a wide range of services within the Seva family. So it's closer to the Mondragon than the Emilia-Romagna uh, example. I would suggest when thinking of reaching scale for the Seva model, uh, perhaps a comparative analysis of this Emilia-Romagna and Mondragon uh, model uh, would be good. Uh, and there are pros and cons, of course, to both, and there is inspiration from both. Um, yeah, and I will stop here. Thank you. Back to you, Yemi. Thank you so much, Simel. We definitely have to follow up with you on that. Um, now, let me invite our last respondent, uh, Samik Das. Tamik is working currently with the World Bank Group as Senior Rural Development Specialist in the India office. Um, the person in the hot seat as far as the livelihoods mission and its uh, rural transformation work goes, especially the boosting the enterprise portfolio. Uh, he's been uh, you know, in the field for 20, 25 years, so uh, the right person for this. So over to you, Samik. Um, again, apologies for just making sure that you're on time, but um, I will pipe up at eight minutes. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Amini. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I think it's a very interesting uh, speech that I think has been made on the presentations, but I like what Salman made some provocating comments uh, related to the identity conflict, as well as whether we are doing profit for what. And I think historically, if we look at what we are doing on the collectivization of women, is basically have been on social uh, uh, impacts or outcomes or empowerment places. Now, as we have evolved into uh, NRLM, as the scale up happened with the SSG program, we are trying to retrofit into a commercial model, as I will see, uh, for basically for the commercialization and business aspects of this collective. I think that is where this disconnect is happening in terms of the conflict in identity. I think there's a transition in identity, I would put it within. And this is a phase, and I think we will transit into something with identity, which will be much, much more uh, 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 kind of impactful in terms of both the outcomes we are working on, in terms of social impacts, as well as uh, as well as well economic impacts or profitability, uh, profitability with uh, sustainable social impacts. I think India is going through that phase, and our entire social mobilization that has been happening. If I may take the, take the example of NRLM, which we are supporting from the bank side with various projects, uh, is the only platform I see today. If, I, if you want to consider platform approach to scaling up, I think NRLM is the platform to scale up uh, 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 open collectivization, if I may put it that way. And why I'm saying that? We are talking about 75 million women who have been mobilized into SSGs uh, around the country, uh, and they have been federated into 400 plus uh, village organization or panchayat level federation, and they have been further co-federated co into around 300,000, uh, sorry, 30,000 plus cluster of block level federation, and reaching to around 566,000 village across India. And what is more remarkable when I talk about these figures and look at the spread and kind of an outreach of this program. The estimated figure that the financial capital they're leveraging from various, from their own savings, bank credit, and grant is around $72 billion. So can you Im imagine the impact it's creating in the rural economy as, as, this, as this fund revolve and reach out to various form of economic activities or social services that this fund is doing? So I think if you take that larger picture of where we are coming at it, so it's a huge proportion, uh, a huge kind of market we are working with this. So, uh, and, and I also look at financial intermediation as rightly pointed out in the SEVA presentation as a, as a economic uh, activity or a women's collective to work with. And if you take these 400,000 village organizations as, as say women economic collectives, then we have but we have a lot to work with this. So, so my, my limited point here is that to move forward on this agenda, 
there is a need for various stakeholders, including CSRs, foundations, to really innovate, influence, and co-create with NRL as the platform. I think that's the platform, and we are already a lot of us are working on this platform to, to really innovate, co-create, and build various various women-based collectives. But one important aspect we need to look at is also to see whether how we balance out the grant subsidy elements in the startup of women collective vis-a-vis -vis financials, financials coming from a uh, formal financial sector. Why I'm saying that? Uh, because the formal finance sector has not been very, very receptive to women collectives, as was, uh, as was uh, uh, mentioned in the previous presentation. Uh, there is they don't there is no acceptance basically from the regulator the policymakers or the lenders in terms of in terms of this collective being financially a viable entity for them to put money in. so i think we need to look at other instruments of financing this kind of uh, 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 collectives uh, for example uh, we are doing uh, some kind of uh, work in tamil nadu with the tamil nadu rural transformation project where we are looking at a grant plus credit model where we thinking about a matching grant program, working through the banks to bring in funds into the micro entrepreneurs as well as women uh, collectives to basically access finance. And not only access finance, but also as, as, as similar to what Seva is doing in terms of social enterprise kind of services. And, and, and these services are basically to ensure that we are able to work keeping the ecosystem needs in mind. And, and what is required going forward is basically to see what is happening in the ecosystem overall to, to promote this promote this women collective or any kind of enterprises. We have been very short in analysis, I feel, when we go into a microeconomy to understand and put a good enterprise in terms of uh, in terms of making it viable and making it actually have impacts on, on, on its business as well as social impact. So there is a requirement, I feel very strongly to really have very good analysis of the micro level of what kind of my, uh, women collectives would work apart from their empowerment uh, outcomes, whether the business viability is there or not, which sectors to focus on, what part of the value chains they would work on, which uh, are we only looking at the farm sector or we have to work with the non-farm sector. I think there's a lot of work to be done on the non-farm side. I think the biggest job creation in the enterprise sector will, will be through the non-farm and, and service sector in rural areas also. So how do you bring that in? And and we also very much agree, I very much agree with when we say it has to be a long-term process. It is not just a five-year project approach. We have to look at how do we how do we uh, work on a long term basis beyond uh, beyond just a couple of uh, pilots and then go out? It becomes a very boutique approach, and I totally totally see that with what uh, uh, Ben and, and Maria and I ben said. Thank you. So lastly, I would like to say that uh, this one thousand APO plan is a very good approach. They are, they, though many may fail, but the ones who will survive will on will on aggregate basis definitely achieve scale, but there is a similar focus required for women collective model to achieve uh, scale, especially in non-farm enterprise sector. But however, in my personal view, I feel the overall enterprise promotion ecosystem uh, uh, for collectives or for individual entrepreneurs, and particularly for women is very fuzzy. There is, uh, and it's not addressed systematically from the policy perspective, as well from intervention perspective. There are efforts being made but we need to do more. Coming to the NRLM, I think uh, we are supporting NRLM to bring in these elements in terms of supporting enterprises, bringing in new kind of financial products to support NRLM. We are also trying to build in a lot of business development services to, to support NRLM uh, to scale up its enterprise kind of agenda with the women collectives uh, through the SSG program. Uh, and this is uh, all from my side. Uh, 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 Yamini, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, wonderful evening spent with um, such lovely speakers and respondents. Um, we just have 10 minutes. Of course, I've been a terrible moderator, but it was also interesting. I didn't want to stop anybody. Um, but we have about 10 minutes, and there are a few questions on the chat. The first one is to Seva on the ESS. Um, I request someone from the Seva team, Renana Ben, Mirai Ben, uh, 
to take that question. Uh, there's a second question in the Q&A to, directed to Mr. Vidyanand that I'll copy paste in the main chat. But uh, let's start with um, Seva first and then I'll uh, move to Mr. Vidyanand. Uh, thanks, Yamini. Um, <clears throat> actually, uh, that question has been answered by Nithya in the chat itself, but I will ask Nithya to just very briefly, can you make those points? But before we go into that, <clears throat> I thought that it was very fascinating what the speaker said. And I think, of course, we don't have time now, but the issue on identity, the issue on formalization, the issue on finance, um, I think these are all issues relating to the main system. We are trying to develop a new type of um, organization and we need the system to support it and at this time the system is not supporting it so how do we build up what do we need to build in the system to support it so i think uh, you know out of that out of all the discussions this is the big question that has uh, emerged but i will ask nitya to answer the exact question nitya <coughs> Uh, thank you, Dananabha. Uh, so, Shreya on chat asked us about, in context of large migrating populations, how does the growth of an enterprise happen, in with given the context of a timeline being high for it to become sustainable? And sharing our lessons from Seva, what we've seen is in spaces which see a lot of out migration, and for example, I'll take Bihar, where a lot of women became much more active in agriculture and we saw local employment opportunities increasing as uh, as more collectives became active over there in fact the legitimacy of women as farmers was established when they formed an fpo over there and were able to increase their incomes uh, but i'll also contrast with it with our experience of delhi where a lot of migrants actually come in and in times of pandemic we saw a lot of fluctuations in our work when many artisans and home-based workers actually went back to their villages. So you see impacts in both places. Um, the experience of credit cooperatives has been is that members who were migrants went back to their home, but when they actually came back to Delhi with regular follow-ups, 95% of them paid back in time. Um, and there are many interesting loan requirements also come up, which are very migrant centric with their needs, where they build, they aspire to build assets like houses uh, for securing their retirement plans back in their home villages. Um, regarding the second point where how do we encourage more women to become to save and invest in enterprises, uh, Seva has been encouraging it through financial literacy, uh, just the knowledge of encouraging savings and then enabling it through membership in credit cooperatives. And a typical share is usually valued at a low price, which makes it affordable for a poor woman, even as little as 100. Um, but because they're connected to large organizing networks, also sometimes the trust that builds with it encourages them to save and invest in such institutions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Seva team. Um, let me turn to Mr. Vijanan, the question to you on, um, oh gosh, I just lost it. Uh, I saw the question. I saw the question. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Now this, when I mentioned ethics, yes, most of the products are purchased based on trust. This is neat, clean, and Kudumbashri people will not do wrong or any livelihood people. So, but some of them do some kind of mixing with other ingredients or low quality thing. The trust in the entire thing collapses and you can't rebuild the market. So, that has to be built up. It's just trust based. You can't based on any uh, uh, kind of tests or uh, certification at this point. So, that is what I mentioned. While we're discussing this with Kudumbashri, somebody drew an example from TN Nainan who in one of his books seems to have said misfeasance, non-feasance, and malfeasance. So not doing something and doing something wrong. And most importantly, malfeasance. That is what I was suggesting. Should be avoided for this to get access. It's like the participatory organic thing. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Vijayanand. Uh, Simel, great points to you because you've been very actively responding to your questions on chat. So I'll come back to you in a moment. But there's a new question on, from Ashok B to all the panelists. So I'll leave it to you to see which who which one of you wants to take it up. I know Seva talked about a financial 
products pipeline so maybe you want to begin and then one of the respondents also please while thinking of financing instruments to these enterprises what's your take on utilizing emerging ideas like marketplace portals and peer to peer platforms so it's open to all the panelists starting with seva maybe and then we turn to anyone else um uh, mirabin do you would do you want to take that or shall i um i wanted to say something on the marketing portals actually uh, quickly which is that in the recent months we've been engaging with gem the government e marketplace and uh, some of the other portals uh, also in the private sector and i must say it has been quite a challenge i mean there's still a long journey but first of all most of these portals think of women as uh, micro entrepreneurs but not a collective social enterprise so the systems are not geared the categories of products that we are producing sometimes don't fit so there are a whole lot of issues which we are wrestling with but no doubt and as has been mentioned in the point on partnership which was very well taken um one of the things we have been saying to government oh for decades now is that you are the biggest procurer so you should be procuring from women's collective enterprises at least give us a look in because we cannot navigate this world of tenders and it will take us still a little bit more time to get sadi on the portals um i uh, just a quick word on financing uh <clears throat> you know the uh, in 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 the country we have built up a new finance system which is the microfinances and it was built up because rbi and other uh, regulating agencies were willing to <clears throat> have have different rules uh, for microfinance and now of course it's well accepted but microfinance are very small loans what we need is bigger loans to women's enterprises and that whole system is still lacking um i could give example after example of what there is in the uh banking system which women cannot comply with but how women's uh own enterprises are sustainable can be sustainable and they can could repay if you had a different method of uh evaluating them so i just wanted to say that i see and i was very interested in mr <coughs> vidyan's point of a bank like nabard uh, for women for micro enterprises or collective enterprises yeah muted uh, yamini no i uh, yes thanks yamini i think uh, the two points i want to quickly make one is on 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 the dedicated bank for women collective so women micro enterprises like the like the one which so we can learn from is it ap the srinidhi bank i think that's a good good one to look at in terms of how they are uh, they are actually putting uh, dedicated funds to supporting micro enterprises and higher level kind of uh, potential growth enterprises coming from women uh, federations women network so that's one thing which is there and i think bihar is also going that way to develop one uh, bank in bihar in terms of as part of jivika program uh, to to support uh, specific targeted uh, kind of uh, financing to rural women and all. on the fi financing instrument side i think we are not exploring or engaging a lot maybe at at nrl level or at uh, various other forums in terms of addressing this issue, this issue of how to build some products within in the mainstream financial sectors on maybe matching grant program credit guarantee facilities and other ways other instruments which can be brought in that could support uh, support this segment for uh, financing i think uh, there are various uh, kind of small pilots which has been done to to launch various programs through nap funds and a part of the credit guarantee fund side there is some work with cdb on the credit guarantee fund side but i think we need to actively see i think that is one thing where the, the formal finance sector will, sector will feel comfortable to come come and uh, because during a consultation in tamil nadu with various bankers there is clear demand for how do we protect their interest as well as the interest of the segment we are talking about so i think that's something we need to look at more 
And just on the finance, if we could, sorry, jumping in here quickly, a sentence, uh, you know, we should also include insurance in the package of mm -hmm. financial services. Um, and, you know, that has become patently clear during the pandemic. And as Mr. Vidhenan knows, IRDA, the, our regulator, insurance regulator, has shown some interest now in this regard. And today, advisory went out of from NRLM for, for insuring all members, SHG members in the country, and, and, and through the various government programs, and which could be supported through the SHG uh, financing that is available from NRLM, just for information. Uh, thank you so much, Samik, and uh, thank you also, Seva, for uh, responding to that question. Unfortunately, we are at time. So I've been asked by our taskmaster, Gayatri from Imago, to conclude. <laughs> so thank you, everybody, for um, a wonderful hour and a half spent together. I wish we could spend half a day together just you know, going over these these questions. Um, I want to thank Imago and Seva and all the respondents for um, <clears throat> both keeping to time and also allowing me to be a little bit of a timekeeper. Um, over to Imago in case there's any housekeeping announcements. But um, a thank you from my side to also the audience. We still have about 75 participants out of the 100. So thank you so much for staying with us and um, being active on the chat. Um, yes, Gayatri, it would be great if you could conclude. <laughs> no, um, I'll just echo what Yamini said. Thank you to all. Uh, just that we'll also share uh, the recording of this presentation with everyone who has attended today and to everyone who has registered. Uh, and we are also we also have another session tomorrow um, on the evaluation techniques uh, and the technical aspects. And we look forward to seeing you there as well. Thank you all. Could we just do a screenshot? Yes, that would be great. <laughs> Thank you, Yamini. <laughs> bye, everyone. Bye, bye. Bye. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, and bye, bye. Thank you. Thanks very much.